Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's national call. I'm going to give it another minute or so as people get logged on. We'll be with you in just a second. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Welcome to today's national call. We're going to give it just another minute or so for people to log on. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, we're gonna give it just another minute for people to log on. I still see several people um, coming through the waiting room. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hi again, and welcome to today's national call on NLHC's House campaign, um, which works to advance the anti-racist policies and achieve the large-scale sustained investments and reforms necessary to ensure that renters with the lowest incomes have an affordable place to call home. My name is Brooke Shipwright, Manager of Field Organizing at the National Low-Income Housing Coalition, and we're so glad you're here with us today. Um, um, we really have a great lineup today. We're going to be hearing about some federal updates, um, some state and local initiatives, and a report on the recent ballot measures that passed around affordable housing across the country. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to briefly uh, take a moment to thank each and every one of you for your advocacy this year. Today is our last national call of the year. And um, together this year, we've strengthened the movement to end homelessness and advance housing justice. And while there's still a great deal of challenges ahead, I know that together we can and will further affordable housing solutions and just want to take a moment to thank you all for joining these calls and um, all of the, the great work that you do each and every day. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, our first speaker joining us today is our very own Kim Johnson from our policy team to share the latest federal policy updates. Um, it's a busy time right now on Capitol Hill as uh, uh, the House and Senate try to wrap up the appropriations process for fiscal year 2023. So Kim, go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks Brooke and hello everyone. I'm Kim Johnson, Senior Policy Analyst here at NLIHC, and I'm happy to bring what will likely be the fastest Hill update in national call history. So after months of delays and weeks of stonewalling, lawmakers have finally reached a deal on a fiscal year 2023 spending bill, which is very exciting news. We're hearing that the legislative text for the bill will be released this afternoon, likely in the next few hours. And as soon as that text is released, um, our VP of Policy, Sarah Sadian, and I will be delving into it to analyze the funding proposed for HUD and USDA's vital affordable housing, homelessness, and community development programs. And we will send out that analysis along with an updated budget chart as soon as it's ready. So stay tuned. There's going to be a lot of information coming your way. And in the meantime, happy, holiday, ha happy holidays to you, to you all. And I will hand it back over to Brooke to keep the call moving. Thanks, Kim. That truly was the, the fastest policy update I think we've ever had, so well done. Um, and we look forward to um, a great analysis from you and Sarah on uh, what that all entails once it's finalized. Um, so we're now going to turn to um, the next part of our agenda, which is um, our next two speakers are going to be Jeff Olivet, Executive Director of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, 
and Richard Cho, advisor for HUD Housing Services. They're going to share um, updates on a couple of federal initiatives happening right now to address homelessness across the country. Um, the United uh, States Interagency Council on Homelessness released today a strategic plan to end homelessness called All In, and Richard Cho is going to provide an update on the House America um, initiative to address our nation's homelessness crisis. So um, we're so excited to have you both joining us today. Thank you for your time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Thank you so much, Brooke. And thanks to the National Low Income Housing Coalition for having us here today. I am pleased to share with you all in the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. And Marcy, who leads our policy team, just put the link in the chat. If you have a minute, click on that, take a, take a look, dive into it, read it. The plan has been built from the ground up. We, we based this plan on public feedback and conversations we had with thousands of people from more than 600 communities. And we talked to mayors and providers, street outreach workers, housing developers, advocates, and most importantly, people who have lived experience of homelessness themselves. I'm pleased to say that in the last two years, the Biden-Harris administration has worked with local and state leaders from across the country to halt the alarming increases in homelessness we saw from 2016 to 2020. And you'll hear from my colleague, Richard Cho, in a few minutes around what we're seeing in some of those latest trends. But we're not satisfied with flattening the curve. We want to reverse this trend and ultimately reduce and end homelessness. This plan leads with an ambitious goal of reducing homelessness 25% by 2025 through a stronger than ever focus on housing and services, responding to the crisis of unsheltered homelessness, preventing homelessness before it happens, and eliminating racial inequities. All In is the roadmap for how the federal government can accelerate progress and build on the amazing work you all are doing in communities across the country. The plan is built around six pillars. We've got three foundational pillars focused on equity, data and evidence, and collaboration at all levels. And we have three solutions pillars that are focused on housing and services, crisis response, and preventing homelessness before it begins. In a country where racial discrimination has made people of color, especially Black Americans and Native Americans, more likely to experience homelessness, All In will work to eliminate these disparities. In a country where many Americans live paycheck to paycheck and one crisis away from homelessness, all In will work to fix the public systems and make them work for people who have been left behind by failed policies and economic exclusion. In a country where roughly the same number of people become homeless and escape homelessness on a daily basis, All In aims to prevent homelessness before it happens. In a country where rents are rising, but the minimum wage does not even cover a two bedroom in any state, and where the shortage of affordable units is nearly 7 million units. That's all National Low Income Housing Coalition data. In that context, All In will expand housing supply and access. In places where people often wait months, even years for the services they need, this plan will make healthcare, including mental health and substance use treatment, job training, and other supports more accessible. In places where people are turned away from shelters, either because there aren't enough beds or because some shelters have discriminatory requirements, All In will urgently address the basic needs of people in crisis. In places where people are arrested for sleeping outside when they have nowhere else to go, All In treats homelessness like a life and death public health crisis, not a crime. In a time where fact and fiction about homelessness are muddled, all In relies on data and evidence to show what works. And in a time where people are more divided than ever, this plan will increase collaboration across systems, jurisdictions, and sectors so that we are all in on ending homelessness. In addition to today's, to today's release of All In, we're pleased to announce a new initiative spearheaded by the White House and the US Interagency Council to address unsheltered homelessness 
in targeted communities. This initiative will launch early next year with a cohort of cities and states. The initiative has the weight of the White House and 19 federal agencies behind it and will involve full-time federal staff support working closely with these communities, as well as a commitment to provide regulatory relief so that jurisdictions can move more quickly to address unsheltered homelessness. And all of this work complements HUD's recent announcement of $322 million and 4,000 4, vouchers for unsheltered and rural homelessness. Many people ask if it's possible to end homelessness. And after almost 30 years in this work, I believe down to my core that the answer is yes. We have no further to look than the 55% decline in veteran homelessness that we've achieved over the last decade, including an 11% decline in veteran homelessness since the pandemic began. We need to look no further than the substantial reductions we've seen in family and youth homelessness. These successes prove that where we invest resources, we make progress and that we can make progress even under the most difficult of circumstances. The stakes could not be higher. The release of this plan coincides with this week's Homeless Persons Memorial Day, where communities across the country will read names and will remember the tens of thousands who have died without a home this year. Homelessness is deadly, but it is also preventable. And that's why we're here. That's why we're here today. And that's why we're here going forward to prevent and end homelessness by scaling what works and developing creative new solutions until we live in a world where no one experiences the tragedy of homelessness and where everyone has a safe, stable, accessible, and affordable home. Thank you all for all the amazing work that you've done this year, for the work that you'll do next year and beyond. Uh, we are thrilled to be in partnership with you in this important work. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Richard Cho from HUD. Thank you so much, Jeff, uh, and congratulations to you and um, just huge appreciation to you, Jeff, and your whole team, uh, Marcy and others at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness for uh, getting the plan out. It's been a long time coming, um, but really excited to see all in uh, finally see light of day. Um, I'm here to just uh, provide some updates. Um, also this morning, um, uh, coupled with the release of the new federal plan to end home prevented in homelessness, HUD released um, our uh, results of our 2022 point in time count, uh, and also provide an update on our House America initiative. Uh, but as most of you may have seen, uh, we released our 2022 annual homelessness assessment report part one, also known as the point in time count report. Uh, and again, that provides uh, the results of the point in time count that took place in early 2022, in most places in January. Uh, and just as a reminder to everyone here, the pit count is one of the measures um, that we use to measure um, the prevalence of homelessness. Um, PIT is a one, a single night snapshot of homelessness in America, and it provides the only national estimate that we have that captures both uh, people who are in shelters and transitional housing, as well as people who are experiencing homelessness uh, in unsheltered settings in, on the streets, in encampments, um, in vehicles, or other places not meant for human habitation. Um, Pit count is also not meant to represent everybody who experiences homelessness. It's not uh, meant to be capture the entire universe of homelessness. It's really just a snapshot that enables us to make comparisons from one year to the next uh, to determine if homelessness is going up or down, um, or uh, to make reliable comparisons of, of communities across communities around the country. Um, and so I wanna remind everybody the results that we released um, really provide a picture of what homelessness looked like at the beginning of 2022. Um, this is the first complete point in time count that uh, we've had um, nationally since the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, arrived to the U.S. in, in early 2020. Um, and so, as you, many of you know, um, last year in 2021, the point in time count was disrupted. Many communities did not conduct the unsheltered portion of the count. And so, therefore, uh, 2022 provides the first full picture of what homelessness looks like during the pandemic. Uh, and therefore, we do a lot of comparisons against 2020 data. So the report really released um, this morning shows that there were 582,462 people experiencing homelessness on a single night in early 2022. That um, compared to 2020 
is a just a 0.3% increase. Um, so basically homelessness, you could say it's slightly increased or essentially stayed flat. Um, interestingly, the number of people who are sleeping in sheltered settings decreased by 1.6%. But the number of people who are sleeping outside in unsheltered settings actually rose by 3.4%. And because there's slightly more people in shelters than who are in unsheltered settings, um, the, essentially the rise in unsheltered homelessness was offset by some decreases in sheltered homelessness. Um, beneath that overall number, um, there's both positive and negative trends. Uh, as some of you know, we released earlier this year um, the results on veterans, uh, and homelessness actually declined among veterans by 11% uh, compared from 2020 to 2022. For families and children, homelessness also declined by about 6%. And unaccompanied youth, um, we've had um, pretty good, reliable data through the point in time counts on unaccompanied youth since uh, 2020. Um, uh, ho homelessness among youth declined by 12%. But homelessness also rose for um, a single individual, so those are adults who are not part of a family or who don't have children with them, uh, and it rose even higher for um, individuals who have disabilities who are long-term homeless, the group that we call people who are chronically homeless. Um, it rose actually 15%. Um, rural areas actually experienced um, the biggest um, geographical kind of area uh, increase of, of 6% um, in homelessness. So these results totally, um, we can see are kind of results of two different opposing factors. On the one hand, um, the economic crisis that was associated with the pandemic, along with the dramatic increases in rental costs, um, and also a couple of major national disasters, um, particularly in the Gulf region, are um, three factors that contributed to increases in homelessness. On the other hand, the investments uh, and actions taken by the Biden-Harris administration and Congress, and also many of you, um, prevented an overall spike in homelessness. If you recall at the beginning of COVID-19, we were all worried about homelessness um, rising dramatically as a result of COVID-19. Well, the actions that we've collectively taken have actually prevented that spike um, in homelessness that we feared. Um, first and foremost, emergency rental assistance helped more than 12 million renters to make their payments or and avoid, avoid evictions. And I want to uh, pause to just give a shout out to the National Low Income Housing Coalition and all of its partners for your advocacy and leadership in the emergency rental assistance program. It's really through those efforts that we help many, many people lose their homes uh, and avoid homelessness. Um, in addition, things like the economic impact payments um, and the enhanced child tax credits that uh, families received um, help poor families to cover basic household costs, especially housing. And some of the data that we have from our Pulse survey shows that the biggest expense that families use their enhanced child tax credit uh, uh, funds with uh, was to cover uh, rent and utilities. Um, VA and HUD also um, re-elevated the effort to end veteran homelessness as a top priority for our agencies. And we used resources and flexibilities from CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan um, to bring more veterans out of homelessness and also to prevent veterans from becoming homeless in the first place. And then HUD also provided, continue to expand um, our youth homelessness demonstration program, which I think is why we've seen um, decreases in youth homelessness. Um, so the data clearly shows, though, that, um, you know, keeping homelessness flat, that's not our goal. Um, our goal is to achieve President Biden's vision of a homelessness uh, of an America without homelessness. And I know what the data shows is that we need more work, especially for the populations where we're seeing increases, people who are uh, individuals, people with disabilities, as well as people who are in unsheltered settings. Um, individuals actually represent 70 percent of the nation's homelessness population. But um, with the exception of veterans and youth, um, they don't receive um, dedicated investments um, from our appropriations um, in housing and services. A lot of resources go to families. A lot of resources are now going to youth because of the YHDP program. And that's a good thing. But we've not seen as much increases in uh, uh, targeted homeless assistance for individuals. We also need um, some more targeted and dedicated efforts to focus on the unsheltered homelessness crisis, in particular homeless encampments. Uh, and that's why um, the resources that HUD will be awarding soon um, through our unsheltered NOFO, plus the White House and USICH um, effort that Jeff mentioned are really critical. Um, and last but not least, um, we need more permanent supportive housing. Um, the decreases that we saw in chronic homelessness from 2010 to 2016 coincided with a pretty significant national increase in the availability of permanent supportive housing. But since 2016, the pace of new permanent supportive housing creation has slowed significantly. So we need to get back on track with creating more permanent supportive housing. Um, meanwhile, um, remember the 2022 point in time count data, that's early 2022. So 
we don't see any of the effects yet of a lot of the work that we did um, during 2022 to address homelessness, including uh, the American Rescue Plan resources, the emergency housing vouchers, about 70,000 vouchers. Most of those actually leased up during 2022, not at the beginning of 2022. So we'll see the results of those in future um, data, um, including January 2023's point in time count. And then, uh, which brings me to House America, um, the results of uh, the impact of House America and the big push that we made with about 105 communities who joined this initiative uh, and set specific goals on how many people they're going to rehouse by the end of this calendar year and how many additional housing units they're going to add to the pipeline that will serve people who are experiencing a risk of homelessness. Um, the impacts of House America also will be seen in next year's point in time count. So where are we with House America? Um, as you, some of you know, we, we kicked this off in September 2021, and we uh, essentially um, launched it as a challenge, a 15-month challenge, where Secretary Fudge at HUD called on mayors and governors and county leaders to join HUD and to make, make specific numeric commitments on how many people they will rehouse in, from homelessness into permanent housing by the end of 2022, and how many additional housing units they're going to add to the pipeline by the end of the calendar year. Um, so we are now in the phase where we're gearing up for that end date of that initial challenge. We've had a few communities so far, um, San Antonio, uh, the city of Seattle, the state of Oregon, Burlington, Vermont, and New Orleans, who've all made some public announcement that they've actually achieved or in some cases um, exceeded or surpassed their goals ahead of schedule. We have um, uh, some communication from several other communities that they've also achieved their goals already um, and are holding on to a public announcement that they'll make soon. Um, and then we're going to look in at the full end of the calendar year, um, December 31st, to give a full rack up of where we are. But collectively, we're tracking through our data that the House America communities have so far uh, rehoused 90,000 people and added 20,000 units of housing to the development um, pipeline. So uh, we had uh, set a goal nationally to have 100,000 people rehoused and 20,000 units. So we've uh, looks like we've hit um, and maybe we'll surpass our unit creation goal. Uh, and we're at about 90% so far of the rehousing goal with, with some more weeks to come and uh, a little bit extra data that hasn't come to us yet. Um, so uh, the other thing I'll just say is that we know a big part of our success was due to the emergency housing vouchers. Uh, and this is a program that I think has been game changing for efforts to end homelessness. It's, it's, they're leasing up faster than any other voucher program that HUD has ever implemented. 100% uh, of those vouchers have already been issued to households and nearly 59% of them are under lease. That means there's 41,000 households who've now been moved from homelessness into permanent housing. Um, and it's really, uh, I think, um, changed and breathed new life into efforts across the country to rehouse people experiencing homelessness. And then looking into 2023, um, we're gearing up for uh, essentially to help work with USICH to implement all in. Um, that includes things like announcing um, our unsheltered and rural homelessness grants that I mentioned, uh, and also some additional actions that we're going to be taking to, to really um, further uh, strengthen efforts to rehouse people as well as build more um, affordable housing to prevent homelessness. Uh, and then as I, uh, one of the pillars that Jeff mentioned is our, that's part of All In um, is to really build collaboration at all levels. And House America is mentioned specifically in All In uh, as uh, one of those examples of how the help federal government can partner with communities. Uh, we've talked to some of the communities, the 105 communities that are part of House America, and many of them said they wanna continue the momentum and actually build on it in the future. Um, so uh, stay tuned for more uh, on both um, where we are fully with House America's um, progress to date, uh, as well as where we might go next with House America in the future. Um, so with that, I will we'll turn it back to you, Brooke. Thanks so much, Richard and Jeff. That was such a great overview. Um, we do have several questions. Um, so I'll ask a few of these um, that we have time for. Uh, Jeff and Richard, how will you approach leaders in the next Congress on advancing these plans? Um, and also this person, this is from Jerry, also shares many thanks for being with us today. Um, and I'll just add, you know, we it's great to see the administration taking action where it can to prevent and end homelessness. Um, and as you know, we also need investments from Congress. Um, so how do you all, um, plan to work with Congress to, to advance um, these, in, these initiatives and get additional investments that are needed. Uh, I'll take a shot at this first, Richard, and then if you want to uh, add on anything. Um, I, I want to, again, commend the Low-Income Housing Coalition and all of its 
member agencies for the great work you all do with Congress, because I think it is really game changing. Uh, when you look at the work that Richard talked about, you having a real impact on during the, the uh, er early days and, and first couple of years of the pandemic, that really made a difference. So that's a charge. That's not just a compliment. That's a charge to the future for you all. Um, you know, our uh, our vehicles for working with Congress are uh, first and foremost through the president's annual uh, budgeting process and the appropriations that uh, that Congress does. And if you look at President Biden's commitment uh, to these issues over the last couple of years, it's been very strong. Um, the the two hundred thousand. Uh, new vouchers that would be in the FY23 budget. I know we'll find out more news about that this afternoon, uh, but I think you've got you've got uh, a, a real commitment from this administration to keep prioritizing these issues. Beyond that, we have um, increasingly strong relationships on Capitol Hill. We're trying to make those bipartisan in nature. Where you know, I, I truly believe that this is isn't and shouldn't be a, a partisan issue. That we can find common ground across. Uh, the political spectrum, and we get into a process of providing technical information and assistance uh, to our, our partners on Capitol Hill to make sure that they have the information they need to make legislative decisions. Um, that That's sort of the, the parameters of how we operate. Uh, and so I think we will do our part in this, and we challenge you all uh, in the advocacy world and, and in, in the national networking world to do your part as well. Challenge accepted. <laughs> um, Richard, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that. I think Jeff covered it. I mean, the okay, president's great. budget is um, usually what uh, the best vehicle we have to communicate our priorities. And um, I'll say uh, next year's president's budget um, has been informed um, with the thinking that, you know, it's not like all in was developed overnight, right? It's been in the process for a while. So um, the, it will reflect um, as best we can within the constraints that we have. Um, the, the the our commitment to um, collective commitment to um, addressing homelessness. But as Jeff noted, you know, um, we in the executive branch, we we do our best to communicate with the Hill on what we see as needed. Um, uh, but the the Congress works for its people, um, and so um, you know, uh, like him, hearing from its con their constituents is probably the most important thing um, to communicate this. But um, all in and our president's budget are the executive branch's statement for what we think we need. Um, and then there's democracy, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Um, and Carrie Hill asks, what about this plan is radically different compared to past efforts that you feel um, confident that it will truly work? And additionally, will it have some longevity to endure potential administration changes in the future? What we're trying to do in this plan is take the things that have been strongest about past plans. If you all have been around for a while, you've seen uh, plans uh, issued by by each administration. Um, we've tried to carry forward some of the things that have really worked. We talked some about the veteran homelessness uh, reductions that we've seen. Those were based on a housing first commitment that has historically been a bipartisan commitment. I think that has been challenged in recent uh, months and years. But uh, we've tried to carry forward the things that are working. The two, I would say, most dramatically new directions for this plan are a deep commitment to racial equity that is explicit and clear, and a commitment to work on upstream prevention. And I think about upstream prevention as the place where this is not the homelessness response system that is designed to fix that. It's inherently a cross-sector set of conversations, collaborations, mobilization of resources to stabilize people so they don't become homeless in the first place. And I think those two dimensions of the plan, equity and prevention, are the, the strongest new directions that we're taking things. Thanks, Jeff. And I know you have to hop off. We do have a couple more questions. Um, so I will let you go as you need to um, and um, direct a couple more to Richard if you're able to stay on. Um, and then uh, we'll move on to our, the rest of our agenda. Um, thanks again, Jeff. Thank you so much, Brooke, for having me and for everything that you all are doing. Those of you who are out there uh, listening, uh, it's great to see some familiar names and uh, and know that you're out there. Keep up your great work, and we look forward to ongoing partnership with you all. Richard, thank you for uh, taking whatever may come next. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff, and congrats again.
Um, Richard, we have a question from Ken. Uh, do we have the numbers to know how many of those who are homeless are senior citizens? That's a great question. We, we don't in the point in time count or the AHAR part one report. Um, because uh, that level of demographics is not always reported up to HUD from every community who conducts their point in time counts. We have the age breakdown data in our AHAR part two report, which is, um, uh, I know some of you are HUD data geeks, but that's the report where we look at how many people used homeless services over the course of the year. And that's where it's data from homeless man homelessness management information systems that then gets reported up on an aggregate basis to HUD. In that report, the latest one we've re released was from 2020, and that included both 2019 and 2020 data um, for federal fiscal years. And those uh, that one shows that the number of uh, people who are age um, 62 and older is actually increasing. Um, and the, even those who are um, kind of in the 55 and older are increasing. And so we have seen that trend um, year after year of more and more older adults and seniors um, who are aging, and that is a disturbing trend. But unfortunately, we don't have that in the pit count. Um, data, but we have that in the um, AHAR part two. Um, stay tuned for sometime next year when we'll release the, um, the latest uh, AHAR part two uh, from fiscal year 2021 um, data. Great, thank you. And related to the, the pit count, um, a question from Sarah Hasmer is, is there a common survey used for the pit? And if so, is there a way we can access it? Um, I know Sarah does a lot of work around um, gender identity and that cross sector between gender and housing. And uh, Sarah says that they're interested in free, the phrasing of the gender questions, particularly whether transgender people are forced between choosing whether to select female, male, or transgender. Um, she notes that that's uh, a challenge with the census household pulse survey. Yeah, I'll, I'll drop in the chat the link that provides the um, what we call as the sort of like standards for um, point in time count data collection. Um, communities um, have to use that as the kind of uh, minimum for the data elements that they're required to collect through the point in time count surveys. Um, but then communities can always um, add on to that with HUD approval um, from there. But I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat so you can take a look. And we are always open to, again, within what uh, sort of um, we're statutorily allowed to do um, to make updates in ways that make sense. So I'm open to suggestions and feedback. Great. Thank you. Um, two more questions. We have one from Jerry. Uh, how will HUD leverage the initial success of House America to expand into the remainder of the country? Um, that's a great question, and um, I will maybe not scoop myself, but we are in conversations with current House America communities. We're in conversations with other national partners, um, including National Income Housing Coalition staff and others, um, to to determine um, where we go from here with House America. But I think universally we've heard House America has been a huge success. We also have a whole new cohort of mayors and governors and county leaders that have just been elected, um, and so there's a lot more enthusiasm. The one thing I can say is that, um, you know, almost everywhere in the country, um, mayors will say that homelessness and addressing homelessness is their top priority. Uh, and yet most of them don't know what tools they have to address homelessness. Um, there was a, a great survey that was conducted by the Menino um, Institute up in Boston um, that uh, conducted that survey of mayors. How's America is, is a way to help us engage mayors to say your tools are to bring the partners together to bring people into homes. Um, and, and to essentially help cut through a lot of the challenges that they're facing, whether that's engaging landlords um, or um, helping to engage the private sector. Um, and, it, you know, I think a lot of mayors have felt like their only tools are to call the police chief or public works. And uh, <clears throat> How's America is about helping them understand that they have other tools. So we've seen great success in just the education we've had with mayors and their teams. Uh, and uh, we think it's, it's critical that we um, both continue that and expand it and Again, I think there's a lot more leaders out there who would be really hungry to uh, join in, in a partnership with HUD and USICH. Great. Um, last question. Uh, we, how can we ensure that everyone is working together to address the housing and homelessness crisis, even if they don't agree on the solution to the problem? Um, in clarifying that everyone is uh, means people with lived experience, service providers, government sector, private sector, et cetera. You know, I think that's a great question, and I think the 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 uh, the answer to that question is actually kind of embedded in the question, which is, um, you know, there are a lot of people out there who will criticize the housing first approach, or criticize continuous of care, or coordinated entry, or any other sort of 
um, things that we know to be effective. And I, I say we welcome that. It, we, our efforts can be stronger if we actually engage in meaningful debate, but only if you actually engage in the efforts, right? You can't stand on the sidelines and, and try to criticize efforts to end homelessness when you're doing nothing to actually contribute to, to those efforts. So I would say welcome debate, but get involved in your continues of care get involved in your local plans to end homelessness and efforts to end homelessness. And again, what we're trying to do is say we are all in. We do need to, we do need the private sector. We need people from both parties. We need all um, elected officials, but people who are going to just um, sort of critique efforts or um, throw uh, cold water on the idea that housing first doesn't work, but aren't actually doing anything to solve it. I, I say like that's, that's not actually helping the situation. And so a lot of the um, recent uh, critiques of efforts to end homelessness that I think are really just about trying to undermine our confidence that housing assistance is the thing that people need the most. Um, you know, those those are coming from people who aren't necessarily actually engaged in those efforts. But yeah, if you're if you're serious about if if your local partners or people in your communities are serious about addressing the homelessness crisis and and uh, they want to contribute, um, they want to um, share their ideas. I say um, we welcome them as long as they're willing to stay engaged in that conversation as opposed to just stand on the sidelines. Great. Thank you so much, Richard, for your time and sharing this overview and congrats for um, the success that you've seen so far with the House America initiative. Um, it's really exciting and we're really looking forward to having you and Jeff back on in 2023 for additional updates. Um, there are more questions and a lot of thanks to you both um, in the chat and the Q&A box. If you have time to stay on and answer a few of those, I definitely welcome you doing that. Um, but thanks again for, for being with us today. All right, um, so we're now going to turn to our next speaker. Um, as I think it was Jeff that noted, um, this week will be the annual Remembrance Day for people experiencing homelessness. And with us to share more about this is Reverend Matthew Best from Memorial Blanket Project. So Matthew, Reverend Matthew, I will turn it over to you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm actually uh, now in D.C. Um, when I got on the call, we were in the car on the way to D.C. Um, so the Memorial Blanket Project was started last year. The website is uh, is listed there for everybody to be able to see. This is the second year that we've done this. Uh, um, Last year was started in, um, and um, my my partner in crime is Pat Lamarche, who uh, some of you might know. She's a homeless advocate, um, and uh, and and uh, just a, a wonderful uh, person. And um, we we started this in in Carlisle, and uh, we. Um, we just put the word out of um, uh, trying to have blankets uh, made, homemade blankets and quilts. And uh, we had over 200 uh, blankets and quilts, the idea of raising awareness around the uh, around the issue of homelessness. And, uh, and people uh, from around the country started making them and we had, um, we had great success with this and, um, and it was wonderful. And we had uh, different agencies and we did a podcast and and we had a an encampment and all that type of stuff and it was wonderful and uh, and if you go to the website you can see um, some uh, some some history and some photos and all that type of stuff and so then uh, people wanted to do this again this this coming year and so we're actually doing this on the west lawn of the Capitol uh, in DC um, on Wednesday and and so we have put the word out about this, of course, throughout the, the year. And we're expecting about a thousand blankets approximately uh, from across the country. Um, and these are all handmade uh, blankets, quilts, um, just to give you a sense. So this is one um, blanket quilt uh, blanket that was made. Uh, I picked this up uh, over the weekend from a colleague of mine, uh, who um, in this case, uh, she she has a, a, a church that um, the Welcome Church in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, the, this uh, this blank was actually made from from folks who are experiencing homelessness. And so it's um, 
put together from folks who are experiencing homelessness going to other folks who are experiencing homelessness. So all of the blankets are going to be laid on the, on the West Lawn of the Capitol. And uh, so it's going to be an art installation. And um, we're going to be doing a, a podcast again, and we're going to be interviewing uh, lawmakers. We're going to be interviewing, hopefully, some uh, some folks from different agencies as well, uh, government agencies, but also service agencies, nonprofits. Um, we have some uh, folks who do uh, films. We have other other folks, uh, people who, of course, have experienced uh, homelessness to share their story as well. Um, a variety of different folks. Really, this is about raising awareness about homelessness. Um, and then uh, at the end of the evening, uh, the idea is that all of these blankets are going to those who are experiencing homelessness. And so every single one of these blankets will end up ultimately going into uh, the hands of, of folks who are experiencing homelessness. So um, these blankets come in a variety of different shapes and sizes because, uh, as you all know, ex homelessness is experienced by a variety of different folks. Um, so whether we're really trying to get people to, to get an understanding of that, you know, homelessness comes in a, in a, in a variety of different shapes and sizes. So we have, um, we have baby blankets um, that have been made. We have uh, blankets that are, uh, we were handed last week, we were at Fort Indian Town Gap, uh, which is a, a, um, a national uh, military uh, cemetery up in Pennsylvania. And uh, we were given some blankets that are uh, more towards uh, veterans. Uh, so those are for, for veterans, uh, homelessness, um we have uh we have blankets that were were made that are larger in size to really kind of represent the idea of families that are experiencing homelessness we have blankets that that are more symbolic of uh people who are lgbtq uh, plus to, to symbolize uh that group of folks that are experiencing homelessness we, a, a variety of different thing variety of different uh folks who are experiencing uh, homelessness um so the website memorialblanket.org um if you happen to be in dc the uh blankets will be on display uh from uh people will will our, our folks are going to be coming down on wednesday uh, they're going to start to to put the the uh, put them all out uh, starting about nine o'clock in the morning, and um, they will be out about um, from from about noon. It'll be all out from, um, on the west lawn of the Capitol. Uh, so you're welcome to to come out to see the, the full display, to get a sense of what about a thousand blankets look like. Um, it's a huge, huge uh, display in that sense. And, um, uh, you know, just, just come by, take a look, talk with the folks who uh, have come from a variety of different places. We always, we have this idea that each of the blankets tell a story um, and that, it's not just the the story of uh, it's the story of the people who have made them, but also the story of who they're going to go to as well. Uh, each of these each of these blankets tell a story. And um, this this past week, we were also back here in, in D.C. and we were at the National Cathedral. The National Cathedral was getting behind our uh, our effort as well, which was which was which was big and, and huge and really um, a great support. For us, and we had uh, 95 blankets uh, out on Walker Court, which is right in front of the National Cathedral, and uh, is kind of like a, a dry run, a, a collection point, and um, and it was uh, an opportunity to, to just uh, the symbolism of, of the National Cathedral, not just a, a theological symbol, but also just the National Cathedral. This is where. Presidents have had their 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 funerals before. It's a it's a a national symbol uh, for a country as well. And so um, 
you know, this, this is just, it's really kind of building momentum. Um, it's great to, that we're, we're able to the, get, uh, get some conversation going. And that's really what we're, we're really hoping to do uh, is, is continue to have conversation going. And uh, we applaud the efforts of, um, you know, what we were just hearing um, going on is, is, is wonderful and great. So that's, that's what I wanted to, to offer. And um, I, again, if you're in DC, um, I welcome you to, to stop by. You're also welcome to um, watch uh, any of the uh, interviews that are, that are gonna go on. Um, you, can, you can see uh, through our, um, our YouTube channel, but you can go to the memorialblanket.org. You can get the link to, um, to our YouTube channel to see any of the, the interviews that are going on. And, uh, and yeah, we just uh, appreciate any type of support. If you got any extra blankets that you want to drop off, you're welcome to do that as well. Otherwise, I'll be there. Pat will be there. A whole bunch of other folks uh, bundle up. It's, it's going to be cold, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we uh, appreciate any, any type of support that, that people have. Thank you so much, Reverend Bess. That's, um, it's really exciting to hear about this effort. And I really love uh, to hear about the symbolism that the different sizes and shapes and colors of these blankets represent. Um, you know, you mentioned that obviously a key goal of this effort is to raise awareness for homelessness. Um, and I know you said this is just the second year that you've done this, but what impact have you seen so far on um, your advocacy and building awareness around this issue? Yeah, so uh, I'd, I'd say there's a few things. No, number one, um, we've gotten the attention of several lawmakers. Um, there's there's been several lawmakers that we've been able to do some interviews with. Uh, Representative Cleaver was gracious uh, enough to do uh, do an interview with us several for for a while. Uh, Pat did an interview with him, and it was a wonderful interview. That'll show up actually during our podcast interview. Uh, we also had a couple of, of uh, we we have a couple of other uh, interviews already scheduled in the in the in the in the lineup. We've had a couple of pre-recorded ones that have already gone out on on social media. Um, so this this is something that we didn't have last year. Um, so it's kind of raising this awareness and uh, getting people talking about about this. So that's that's the one thing. The second <clears throat> the second thing uh, just uh, beyond beyond lawmakers is is this is just getting people getting getting people to uh have a putting a face to homelessness and 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 this is something i, I like to talk about is that you know it, it's one thing to have people who are connected to pat or myself who are going and, and making a blanket i mean you know like a colleague giving me a blanket that that's that had you know that's incredible and it's great but when people who are not connected to us are hearing about this and then going and doing this and we have no idea how they they've heard about this it's just something that they're like they feel really called to do they feel really like moved to do something about this because this is a way that they can participate that they can they can do something that's really powerful and that 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 just gets into into like hey you know homelessness is a big issue and it's a big problem and it's a big challenge and and this is something that people can do that they may not be able to put somebody into a house but this is a way that they can show care and concern for somebody that for for me as a, as a pastor uh, what we would say is this is how I can love my neighbor. Um, this is how we can we can share that, hey, I can see somebody's humanity. Uh, this is how we can how we can put uh, humanity on, you know, this isn't about, you know, big numbers, you know, it, oftentimes we have, oh, you know, there's thousands of people or or large budgets and all this. <clears throat> this is how now all of a sudden, homelessness has a name and it has a face and it and it's humanized and i think that's really important um you know when uh the congregation that i have i have served we we did a uh we we went into a truck stop and for a long time especially we started before the the pandemic 
we would go to the truck stop every couple of weeks and we would we would um, um, spend time with folks who lived at the truck stop and we would do laundry with folks and we would uh, make sure that they could get a shower and uh, we would share a meal with folks at, at the at the Denny's and and um, and and that was really important to build relationships with people to hear their stories and those type of things. I mean, that's <clears throat> that's really important. And and this is a way for people to do something similar that they're using their skills and their talents and they're able to humanize. And I think that's that's really kind of a a, a way, you know, <laughs> that just just personalizes this, that humanizes it and and people can do something is is really the key that's that's one Absolutely. thing that Pat always talks about yeah yeah definitely i i couldn't agree more um and we do have a question one more question from cj o'hara um asking have you thought about advocating county coroners to spell out the cause of death um you know such as exposure to extreme temperatures more explicitly as factors um or the cause of death ex itself of people who um, were living in places not deemed habitable, habitable, such as outdoors or vehicles? Um, and is there public access to these numbers? Um, and if not, how can we push that more so that it's it's more, you know, it's easier to access? Well, that, that's a great question, CJ. I have not uh, thought of that. Um, I'm just a, a lowly uh, <laughs> pastor. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, that's that's a great idea. That would be something that um, I would encourage you to go and 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 make an appointment with your with your county coroner and have a conversation. And and that and that just goes for anybody. I mean, that's that's how this works, right? Is you go and you build a relationship with with your local officials, and and it's just about getting to know them and building relationships with them. And not not badgering, but it's a matter of building relationships and saying, "Hey, I've got this concern, and um, and here's something that that's important for for me." And uh, it doesn't have to be somebody outside. This is every single person on this call has the ability to go and, and do these these type of things. So I would encourage you to to do that. I think it's a great idea, and uh, and I'm going to take that back with me. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Reverend Best. We really appreciate your time and your efforts, um, you know, raising awareness about um, people who are experiencing homelessness. And you're getting a lot of love in the chat and the Q&A box. Um, so thank you again for the great work that you um, do each day. And again, for your time uh, to join this call and share how people can, can join in the effort. Um, and we, we do have a few other questions that didn't get answered. We can don't have time to answer live. So if you have time to stick around and answer those, I welcome that. Um, but thank you again. Thank you. Great. Well, now we are going to turn to the next portion of our agenda, um, shifting gears a bit from kind of the federal and other efforts on addressing homelessness and moving into um, kind of an update on what happened uh, this this election cycle, um, what happened on the ballot. Um, NLHC has a new report on housing and homelessness ballot measures um, that that took place across the country. And um, our very own Courtney Cooperman, a housing advocacy organizer at NLHC is going to share more about um, kind of what we learned from uh, writing this report and uh, what efforts happened around the country. So Courtney, with that, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Brooke. Hi everyone, I'm Courtney Cooperman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a housing advocacy organizer here at NLIHC. Last week, we released a new report, Voters Choose Housing, a summary of housing and homelessness ballot measures in the November 2022 elections. And I see that Elena dropped a link to that report in the chat, so thanks so much for that. This report gives an overview of nearly 100 ballot measures that devote new resources to affordable housing, strengthen tenant protections, respond to homelessness, amend zoning and land use policies, facilitate affordable housing development, and tax or regulate short-term rentals. 
The report also features case studies from five campaigns and organizations, and these case studies kind of provide a glimpse into the organizing tactics and key lessons learned from the campaigns. Later in the call, we'll hear directly from organizers that worked on two of the campaigns featured in the report from Colorado and Los Angeles. And just to give some context about why we saw so many housing ballot measures in this election cycle, I think everyone on this call is probably already acutely aware of this context of this year where most temporary protections and resources provided during the pandemic have expired or been depleted, just as rents and other costs have increased. Congress's failure to enact the housing resources contained in the House passed Build Back Better Act, of course, put heightened pressure on state and local governments to find new local funding sources for housing solutions in the absence of that federal delivery of money. Um, so organizers and local elected officials turned to ballot measures as a pathway to secure these new resources and keep renters stably housed. And we saw that these ballot measures were overwhelmingly successful. Housing measures appeared on the ballot in every region of the country across a diverse range of political makeups. The vast majority of ballot measures we feature in the report are from California and Colorado due to state election rules that make ballot measures very common there. But besides these two states, we also feature ballot measures in cities and counties in Florida, Maine, Ohio, Arizona, New Mexico, Missouri, Texas, North Carolina, Maryland, New York, and Montana. We can go on to the next slide. Um, so we break down the housing ballot measures into seven categories in the report. The first is tenant protections, including rent stabilization. The second is bond measures. The third is policies to address homelessness. The fourth is lodging and short-term rental taxes and regulations. The fifth is zoning and land use reforms. The sixth is other taxes and fees, which included vacancy taxes, real estate transfer fees, property taxes, sales taxes, business taxes, and redirections of existing tax revenues. And the last is Article 34 authorizations in California. This might be familiar to anyone in California and new to anyone who's not in California, um, but basically these are ballot measures that are made necessary by this archaic and racist provision in the California state constitution that requires voter approval for government funded affordable housing. Um, so I'll start with a deeper dive into the tenant protections. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Voters approved measures to tighten existing rent stabilization laws in Portland, Maine, Santa Monica, California, and Richmond, California. In Pasadena, California, and Orange County, Florida, voters approved new rent stabilization ordinances. A majority of voters supported rent stabilization ballot measures in every community where they had the opportunity to do so. However, Florida has a state preemption law that prevents local governments from enacting rent stabilization unless there is, quote, um, an existing housing emergency, which is so grave as to constitute a serious menace to the general public. Advocates argue that Orange County is currently experiencing such an emergency, and a majority of voters agree because the measure was approved by 59% of voters. However, that question is kind of tied up in the courts right now. Um, the Orange County Commission is seeking to take the case to the Florida Supreme Court. Um, so we're waiting to see if that will ultimately get enacted, um, but voters were clearly, clearly in favor of it. Another really exciting tenant protection measure passed in Oakland, California. Measure V amends Oakland's existing just cause eviction protections to cover tenants in RVs and tiny homes on wheels on private property. It also adds special eviction protections to protect families with school-aged children and educators from no-fault evictions during the school year. The only tenant protection measure that was defeated in this election cycle was a proposed right to counsel ordinance in Denver, Colorado. Another category of ballot measure that saw great success was bond measures. Um, we can go on to the next slide. Voters collectively authorized nearly $2 billion in bonds for affordable housing development, acquisition, and rehabilitation. Affordable housing bond measures received a majority of voters' approval in every community where they were proposed. And you can see a map of where these bond measures were approved here. 
The only bond measure that was defeated was in Berkeley, California. Again, this measure received 59% of the vote, but because of the local election rules, it needed to clear a 67% supermajority threshold. Next slide. Cities also pursued new taxes, fees, and other mechanisms to raise revenues. Some cities enacted ballot measures that really directly confronted the paradox of homelessness and housing insecurity coexisting alongside extreme wealth. And we'll get to hear about one of these ballot measures um, from Los Angeles shortly from our friend Frank at SCAM. We also saw some momentum for vacancy taxes, which have the dual purposes of curbing real estate speculation and raising revenues for affordable housing. Following the lead of Oakland in 2018, San Francisco and Berkeley both passed measures to tax vacant homes, although a similar proposal was defeated in Santa Cruz. Colorado passed the only statewide housing ballot measure of this cycle, which will dedicate 0.1% of existing income tax revenues to affordable housing programs. And we'll get to hear a little bit more about this measure later in the call from Kathy at Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Next slide. Measures to tax short-term rentals, which are Airbnb, VRBO, and other similar services, is to establish lodging taxes to fund housing programs or to reinvest existing lodging tax revenues into affordable housing were overwhelmingly successful. A new law in Colorado allowed counties and local marketing districts to reinvest their lodging tax revenues into affordable housing and childcare, where these could previously only be used to promote tourism. Um, so because of this new law, we saw a plethora of ballot measures across Colorado um, that voted to approve um, this new flexibility to put existing revenues into affordable housing. However, strict regulations on short-term rentals that sought to limit the number, location, or ownership of short-term rental properties were unpopular among voters and did not pass anywhere that they were proposed in this election cycle. Next slide. Um, so earlier I mentioned California's Article 34. Um, five cities approved authorizations that raise the cap on the number of government-funded affordable homes that cities can develop and own. These all passed by wide margins and advocates in California are gearing up for a statewide ballot measure in 2024 that would repeal Article 34 and make these periodic voter approvals of new affordable housing unnecessary. Next slide. It's also important to note that not all ballot measures will have a positive impact. Sacramento passed Measure O, which is the latest in a nationwide wave of efforts to criminalize unsheltered homelessness. This measure makes it a criminal offense for four or more people to camp on public or private property, and individuals can be punished for unauthorized camping if they rejected available space in an emergency shelter or city authorized temporary campground. Measure O passed with 52% of the vote. There was a significant opposition campaign led by renters and people experiencing homelessness. In addition to its likely harmful effects in Sacramento, this ballot measure also raises concerns that other cities will follow the lead of Sacramento and turn to the ballot box to enact measures to criminalize homelessness. So this is definitely something that we and our partners are keeping an eye on. Next slide. Zoning and land use ballot measures saw mixed results. There were ballot measures that would facilitate affordable housing development in commercial corridors that passed in San Diego and Costa Mesa, California, while there were two competing measures to expedite approvals for affordable housing that failed in San Francisco. However, these two measures, they had kind of the same overarching goal, but with some different policy details. Um, so a lesson learned from that is sometimes voters can get confused if there are two measures that are similar, but with some differences, both on the same ballot, um, and it's best to avoid having those competing measures on the ballot. There were also some measures to inhibit housing development some of these were in reaction to specific projects that generated a lot of opposition, like housing on former school sites or parking lots or golf courses. Those were some of the examples that we saw. Um, fortunately, most communities did reject attempts to limit housing development, but a handful did impose new obstacles. Next slide. Uh, so overall, it's really clear that voters across the country said yes to affordable housing at the ballot box. The widespread success of housing and homelessness ballot measures sends a strong message to elected officials. 
that housing is a winning issue among voters, one that often transcends partisan divides and mobilizes voters who might otherwise feel personally disconnected from the political process. These election results should encourage policymakers on both sides of the aisle to champion affordable housing and inspire housing advocates like everyone on this call to continue pursuing ballot measures as a pathway to achieving major victories for housing justice. Um, so thank you all. I'm looking forward to taking a question or two and to hearing from Kathy and Frank about the campaigns that made these victories possible. Thanks so much, Courtney. This report is truly just so comprehensive and will serve as such a great resource for advocates around the country, um, I, I imagine for election cycles to come. Um, how would you recommend someone who might be new to ballot measures um, utilize this report um, and ballot measures in general as an advoc advocacy tool in future election cycles? For sure. Um, I think the first step is always to figure out what the rules and requirements are in your state around ballot measures. There's a huge, huge uh, variety ranging from, you know, petition signatures to local um, city council referrals. Some states, unfortunately, just don't really have mechanisms for ballot measures. So there's a huge variety. Um, so I would say look into those rules first and then get together with a coalition. Um, if there are other groups that have pursued ballot measures, maybe not on housing, but on other related issues in the past, consult with them, see what have they done to launch successful campaigns? What does it take to really get something off the ground? Um, so I would say those are the first steps for organizing. Great, thanks, Courtney. Um, one other question, um, you mentioned some key takeaways for advocates. Um, I'm curious uh, what, what you take this to mean um, or how we can use this outside of the election cycle um, in our advo advocacy you know, day to day. For sure. Yeah, I think a lot of the messages that were employed in campaigns are not only useful for getting voters to support uh, housing ballot measures, but also can be really effective in advocacy at the local and state and federal levels. Um, so I remember one of our case studies features the campaign in Oakland for eviction um, protections, and the organizers who I interviewed said that they re realized that there were a lot of different pieces of the ballot measure, but the piece about um, protecting families with children from evictions during the school year was what really resonated. So they organized a press conference at a local school with teachers. And I think really just hitting on those messages about the impact of housing in every aspect of life, um, that was successful. It really resonated with voters. So I think that's the kind of thing that resonates with elected officials as well. That's great. Um, well, congrats to you and the rest of the team at NLHC on this really great report. Um, thanks for your time today to share that overview. And for anyone who hasn't had a chance to read this report yet, I definitely encourage you to do so. I believe a, a link to that was shared earlier in the chat. So um, thanks again, Courtney. Thanks, Brooke. And now on the same uh, topic, we're going to turn to Kathy Alderman. Uh, Chief Communications and Public Policy Officer at the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless to talk a little bit about um, some of the ballot measure work that they did in Colorado. So Kathy, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, Brooke, and thanks, Courtney, for that presentation. Um, very thorough, and it's amazing to see so much work going on across the country um, on housing. So I um, was asked to talk a little bit about Proposition 123, which was the statewide ballot measure in Colorado um, that secured about $300 million a year um, in housing investments. And, you know, first, like everywhere else in the country, Colorado is experiencing a huge um, housing crisis, both in terms of a lack of supply, it's estimated that there um, are about 225,000 needed affordable homes, that's both for the rental um, and home ownership opportunities. The cost of house housing, um, because of this lack of supply, has increased significantly, um, with the average price of homes uh, across Colorado going around um, half a million dollars. Um, we're seeing an increase in homelessness, and we know that more um, individuals are living on the edge and experiencing housing instability as we kind of come out of this um, pandemic and we start to see emergency rental resources go away. We're seeing that evictions have returned to pre above pre-pandemic levels. So, you know, just a convergence of a lot of housing issues that is making housing in Colorado just out of reach and unattainable for 
um, lots of folks, and of course we know this impacts those the lowest income and those experiencing homelessness at, at a far higher degree. Um, up until 2019, the state of Colorado only invested about $9 million a year in um, housing development. So it's a no wonder we are where we are today um, with that, that, that little investment in housing. Um, you know, we just haven't been able to produce the kind of housing that's needed and the amount of housing that is needed. Um, and of course, we had federal pass through dollars, but as I think we all know on this call, um, federal investments haven't kept up with the, the housing crisis across the country and certainly the, the homelessness crisis that we're seeing. Uh, in 2019, we were able to secure two funding sources um, for housing, one that brought in about $45 million a year annually, which just um, really started to flow this uh, past year or 2021 um, to 2022. And then one that actually doesn't um, kick in or does the funds don't become available until we're in a year where because of our taxpayer bill of rights, um, citizens won't be receiving a refund. So that that to us is called the, the a TABOR refund, um, which stands for Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which is a com complicated constitutional measure in Colorado that requires voter approval of any taxes and the repayment of overpaid taxes above a revenue the state's allowed to collect. Um, so we start, we've started to see small investments um, in housing, but nothing substantial. And then of course we had American Rescue Plan Act funds. This legislative session directed um, for housing and homelessness about $400 million to housing specifically and $200 million for homelessness. Uh, this is a huge opportunity for Colorado to make investments in housing and in a homelessness resolution. But as we all know, these are one-time funds. And so the idea that in 2026, these funds are gonna be uh, you know, coming to an end and, and spent, we're gonna have this huge cliff effect. So all of these issues converging in Colorado, um, one of our partners, the Gary Community Trust, which is a, a foundation, um, uh, that has an office in Colorado and has really been looking at housing as a way to um, address many other issues across the state, including educational opportunity attainment, economic mobility, um, and just and, and thinking about housing more broadly was really the 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 thought behind this ballot measure. And so Proposition 123 reserves 0.1% um, of current Colorado taxable income. Um, so it's not a new tax, it's just a reservation on taxes already paid to the state that would otherwise go back to voters in the form of a refund, as I just mentioned, a Tabor refund. Um, and then the, that money would be collected um, and used by two agencies in the state of Colorado um, for four purposes. The first is homelessness resolution, um, which would go through our division of housing, and it is likely to bring in about 54 to $60 million. Um, some for rental housing targeted for 60% AMI and below with some opportunities for exceptions in, um, uh, in different communities like our rural resort areas. The opportunity to purchase land for future development and for, for first time home ownership opportunities. Um, local governments will only be allowed to apply for these funds if they demonstrate two things. One is an expedited permitting process to get developments underway and um, an increase of 3% of affordable housing in their local communities over the three-year grant period. So to demonstrate that they're actually using the money that they get to um, increase their affordable housing stock. So the measure um, initially out of the gate had really broad support with more than you know seven and 10 people saying that housing was one of the most important issues that Colorado should be addressing. And um, so it remained in strong support throughout the campaign. And we were um, happy to be a coalition partner in that campaign, but as I mentioned, it was largely led by Gary Community um, Trust. And ultimately the campaign relied heavily on um, you know, all of its partners of which there were over 200 to do email campaigns, um, you know, media outreach, making sure we had op-eds supporting housing. There was, no, um, there was no organized opposition to the measure, which is very unusual in Colorado, especially considering that this did have some taxpayer bill of rights um, implications. We have a very strong Tabor um, uh, contingency in Colorado that uh, supports and, and tries to protect Tabor from any um, from any changes. Um, so the measure ultimately did pass um, with 52% of the vote. 
And now it kind of goes into implementation stages. So the, the first um, thing that it will be done is the legislature will be reviewing it because it is a statutory measure. There's an opportunity to make some changes. Um, you know, all of the different kind of components of the measure have to be, um, you know, just have to be worked out before it can be fully implemented. But it is likely that we will start seeing money flowing from this measure, um, you know, after the first of, or I would say probably in the summer of 2023. Um, you know, I think the report that Courtney's and her team did on the Colorado measure really highlighted some of our, um, some of, you know, our initial messaging, which is really um, something else, else that, that Courtney said is really thinking about how to talk to people about housing issues that they may not, um, they may not even recognize that housing issue. Like they may be complaining that their kids can't move back to Colorado and live in the communities in which they grew up because it's too expensive. That their grandparent or their aging parent um, is gonna lose their homes because uh, property taxes have gone up and they're on a fixed income. You know, driving in some of our urban areas and even our rural areas and seeing the increase of people camping outside because there's not enough affordable housing. So there's always opportunity, I think, to identify those situations that are going to appeal to your audience and, um, you know, talk about housing as kind of the solution for, for all of those, um, those issues. The measure is um, hopefully going to build up to 170,000 um, new homes over the course of three to five years, which will make a huge difference, but obviously is still um, not any making up that deficit that I that I described above. So I think there's still more work to be done um, in housing and homelessness resolution um, in Colorado, but this is certainly one way for us to avoid that um, cliff effect that I think the state is likely going to feel from the investment of American Rescue Plan Act funds. So happy to answer any questions. Um, maybe our next speaker will go and we'll be available for questions after. Um, but appreciate the time to present today and uh, looking forward to um, discussion. Thank you so much, Kathy. And yes, please, um, any questions you have, be sure to type those in the Q&A box. Um, I do have one qu follow-up question. You mentioned a little bit about messaging, and I'm curious um, if that changed depending on, um, you know, where someone lived. Was there kind of like targeted efforts or more of a broad statewide blanket effort, um, a kind of one-size-fits-all message? You know, there was a broad message, which is essentially, you know, that that the housing crisis in Colorado is impacting everyone. Um, there is a, also a lot of uh, messaging around, you know, people should be able to live where they work um, when we don't have um, housing available for teachers, teachers, nurses, and firefighters. We can't have thriving communities. Um, you know, people shouldn't have to drive. Colorado has a very strong environmentally sustainable um attitude towards things and the idea that people would have to drive and therefore create more traffic problems, more air pollution problems um, so far in order to find affordable and attainable housing is really becoming a big issue. Um, and then, as I mentioned, just personalizing those messages to the things that people may be saying they're concerned about, but not tying it directly to housing. Like, I really wish my kids could move back to the state, but they can't afford to or I'm worried about my aging parent losing their home. Um, all of those things uh, can be, can be you know, at least addressed, if not fully resolved by investments in housing. Thank you, that's great. Um, it looks like we do have one question um, from CJ, but if you could answer that um, directly through typing, I would like to move us along to our next speaker, but I really want to just take a second to thank you so much for taking the time to join today's call, Kathy, um, for the work you and your team do every day in Colorado, and congrats on Prop 123 and all of the election engagement work I know you all were in, involved in this year, so thank you. All right, we're going to turn now to Frank Martinez um, from Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing, uh, policy director there. And Frank, I will turn it over to you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hope you all can hear me. Um, happy week before Christmas and, and New Year's and all that. I'm really happy to be here and, and talk to the whole group. Um, I know we don't have a ton of time. I'm going to try to be relatively efficient. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm here to talk about Measure ULA. Uh, which passed here in the city of Los Angeles a couple months ago. Um, it was one of those measures that we weren't sure on election day, but as the ballots kept coming in, it crept up and now we're at about 58%. So it passed uh, quite resoundingly. Uh, measure ULA, it stands for United to House LA. Um, it's pretty much a transfer tax 
uh, and money is going to be used for affordable housing. But I want to get into some of the details. And before I move backwards, I want to start in present day to make this relevant. Um, as you probably all know, we have a, uh, a new mayor here in Los Angeles, uh, Karen Bass, um, although she's a veteran lawmaker and community uh, activist, uh, she's only been, she's still got that fresh mayor smell because she's only been in office for about one week. Um, and she's really hit the ground running. Um, she's working with a lot of our members, SCAMP, by the way, Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing. We represent those, the organizations that build affordable housing in the region. And Mayor Bass has really reached out to us to try to kickstart projects. Um, and I think one of the things that we can really be proud of is that, you know, regardless of who was mayor, uh, who, who won the election, and it, 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 we had a, a closer than expected race here. Um, we were going to present to the mayor, the new mayor, uh, a, a, a holiday gift, an inauguration gift of Measure ULA, uh, which is the first local permanent source of affordable housing funding uh, that Los Angeles has seen in quite a while, uh, maybe even ever. Um, the, the idea is simple. For properties that are worth more than $5 million um, and $10 million and above, when you sell them, uh, there is a fee taken uh, and that money is used to essentially build affordable housing. Um, we and we <clears throat> Now to go back to about a year ago, one of the things that is interesting about uh, ULA is that it was really put together by organizations like SCAMF and other um, you know, thought, um, thought leading organizations and thinkers and academics and affordable housing builders. So it didn't come from the political class. Um, it came from the people who build affordable housing and work for tenants. Uh, we put together this ballot measure and we needed something like 60,000 signatures. We ended up getting almost 100,000. You know, I was walking around with my my one-year-old son in the neighborhood trying to get signatures. I, I didn't get that many, but I got some of them. It was a true team effort and we got it on the ballot and the voters approved it. Um, one of the things that we're really excited about is uh, you know, we do, we have Prop H here, we have Triple H, uh, but those often sunset after 10 years. So it really helps our uh, nonprofit affordable housing members uh, plan for the next year and the next couple of years and the next five, 10 years, um, knowing that these, <clears throat> this funding is going to be there on a permanent basis. It's going to put together a pretty monumental sum, uh, estimates of 800 million, 900 million, um, so close to a billion dollars. Now that that dollar amount uh, is to be determined exactly. Um, and like all, like all things, you know, probably will grow over time. Um, we estimate that it will build more than 25,000 uh, units of affordable housing uh, in, um, in the first decade. And, uh, you know, our, our annual homeless count puts it in the 60, 70,000 range for the county, uh, LA County. Um, and the number of units, the number of households, the number of individuals housed, of course, they all won't be homeless, um, but many of them will be, and many of them will be on the brink, uh, is about a similar number. So true impact. Uh, we expect this to have a true impact, a real impact. Um, we also want to add that uh, it's not just about building more affordable housing. Uh, there is some uh, rental, rental assistance money as part of this uh, for people who are on the brink. Uh, there is some eviction protection. Uh, there's also a little bit of money for um, um, uh, some sort of social housing uh, experimentation and moving that ball forward a little bit. Uh, but the bulk is for building more permanent affordable housing, uh, which is what SCAMF members um, um, focus on, our, our mission-oriented organizations. So that's about it. Uh, it. It passed. We're really happy. Uh, now, I said we, I was going to give you the update. You know, you may have seen Mayor Bass yesterday on Meet the Press, uh, talking about her her priorities that we're working with her on. And I told you what happened. Now what's going to happen going forward this year or you know 2023 and beyond is really the implementation. Um, there's going to be a heavy oversight. SCAMF is going to be involved. A lot of people are going to be involved. We're going to be busy with that. But we're really excited for this big permanent source of, of funding for affordable housing here in the city of Los Angeles. That's awesome, Frank. Thanks so much for sharing about um, that that measure and um, all of the great organizing you all did at SCAMF around this. Um, similar question to what I asked Courtney, but more you know specific to the campaign that you all ran. Um, what do you think this means for you and your advocacy and organizing work moving forward for other initiatives? Well, we try to always build um, on what 
we've done, you know, whether it's census work or COVID work or this. Uh, one thing that I will say that <clears throat> this is a little bit in the weeds, a little bit of local politics, but uh, both in LA, Southern California and California as a state, there's often issues with labor and getting different labor groups on board. Sometimes yes, sometimes not. And, you know, <clears throat> a lot of negotiations there. Labor was <clears throat> labor was a partner with us on this, which we're obviously super excited about. We want to work with them. We want uh, all the same things that they do, which is affordable housing for everyone, jobs for the workers, and houses that their workers can afford to live in, um, and, and, and solid pay for them. So we're really hopeful that uh, that could be something that we can build on for other initiatives, because obviously having labor on board is... Uh, is a really good thing for a lot of reasons, and um, and they're they're obviously a great ally. And if they're if they're not working with you, it can obviously be, it can be trouble. So we we're, we were glad that we were on the same side uh, for Measure ULA. That's great. Well, best of luck to you all as you continue to build on this movement and um, implement this measure. Um, and thanks again for joining today's call. Congrats. Um, so thank you. I was really happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Frank. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna um, close us out here. I want to note um, that the next National House Campaign Call will be held on Tuesday, January 17th um, due to the holidays. Um, and you know, this call is typically on Mondays, but um, with January 16th um, being what we would have had as our, our next call, our office will actually be closed for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, so please note that um, date change. Um, it will be at the same time as usual, though. Uh, so be sure to use NLHC's um, advocacy toolkit and our Legislative Action Center um, to take action in the meantime. And I hope each of you has a really safe and restorative holiday season. Thanks again for your great work and partnership this year. And we look forward to continuing um, in 2023. So thank Thanks so much. And thanks to all of our speakers today. Really appreciate your time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.